I'm going to talk to you about the pattern of strengths and weaknesses method that I developed. I actually first talked about this in 1997, and then in my first essentials book called the discrepancy consistency method. But I'm going to show you what this is about by showing you a case. This is not my case. This is actually a case that Steve Pfeiffer and I did. Actually, Steve, this is one of Steve Pfeiffer's tests. Do you use any of his work? Like the FAR or the FAM? Are you aware of any of Steve Pfeiffer's tests? That looks like a no. You, sh you should be. You really should be. Uh, and, and the reason being is because Steve's understanding of academics is closely tied to PASS. So when you get a weakness in PASS, you can align it to the academic weaknesses. And I'll, I'll uh, talk to you a little bit more about that. But in any case, so let's look at this case of Steve's. So this is called typical kind of problems in reading. Math. Can't remember sequences of steps. Good, remember for, good memory for details. Can't sound out words. Poor spelling. Poor reading comprehension. Look at his WISC scores. Look at his achievement scores. You look at these and you say, well, you know, he's kind of, what would you call him? Some would say slow learner. I actually don't like that term. Um, you know, he's, he's not really very, very low, but he's a little, you know, he's below average, but all of his achievement is basically the same except writing, which is kind of curious. But does he have an ability achievement discrepancy? You know, that method that we, you know, we, we really don't like, but we've been using for a long time. No, but you don't know what to think. What do you, how do you help the teacher? How do you help him? You don't really know. Well, look what Steve found when he gave the cognitive assessment system. The boy had a 92 in planning average, a 92 in simultaneous, 110 in attention, but a 75 a successive processing. When we analyze these scores, um, this is actually a spreadsheet that I'll tell you about that you get for free that does all this analysis. But when we analyze it this way, we find he has a strength in attention and a weakness in successive processing, but he's also just pretty darn good at planning and simultaneous. Wow, what a different view of the same student. I mean, think about that. These kind of scores here, these kind of scores here, your view of this person is very different. So when you look at how that, how he did on the phonological index on Steve's test, 75, just like he did on successive processing. Um, when you look at nonsense word decoding, that demands successive processing, also very low. But look, on irregular words, you know, these are the words that you can't sound out phonetically because, like the word yacht, you know, you have to just know it, right? Um, he's, he's just fine there because he's using simultaneous processing to see it as a whole. See, now your understanding of the variability of this academic performance change, too, because you're looking at him from a different lens as opposed to a WISC lens. And the way that we analyze this, I've rendered in this flow chart here, um, but basically it, it comes down to this. We're going to ask the question, is a PASS score that's lower than the child's average and below 90? So notice I'm using two rules here. There needs to be variability in the four scores, and the lowest score can't be in the average range. And in this case, we certainly have that. So as we work down this here, we see compute the difference between passing achievement scores. We did that, and we found that the child, that there's consistency between low pass score and low achievement. And I'm going to show you that as rendered Next slide. So we have good in planning, good in simultaneous, good in attention, low in successive, significant discrepancy. 
discrepancy between good processing and academic failure. But here's the most important part, consistency between academic failure and cognitive difficulty. That answers the question, why does the student fail? That's the critical question you have to answer before you can even begin to think about what, what to tell the, the student and the teacher and the parent is wrong and what to do about it. You have to answer that question. I can tell you for many years when I used to do what I was taught, you know, the, the, old, the old test that I learned, you get a bill achievement discrepancy, you don't find anything really wrong, you don't know what to tell the teacher, Maybe you go into the subtest level and come up with some cutesy little hypotheses, but it's just guessing. This is different. You could take this to any due process hearing. Think about that. You go to a due process hearing and you decided that the child has a learning disability and the attorney says to you, so, you know, what made you think that this boy has a learning disability? And you say, well, the definition of a learning disability is disorder and one or more basic psychological processes with academic failure. He's got it. And he's got good scores, so there's variability. He, he's not uniformly low, and he's had adequate instruction. It's not how, and that's not that he's been, hasn't had the opportunity to learn. He's had, he's, he got good instruction, but he couldn't benefit from the instruction because no one understood really what his weakness was. And you don't need to worry about anything going to a due process hearing with the evidence. Because you have a test explicitly designed to measure basic psychological processes. And you're not trying to use a test that's not based on the brain to define basic psychological processes. Or just use some subtest that someone called processing for whatever reason then that might have been. You have a coherent theory behind it. So it's the strength in the argument that you always want. I've done a lot of expert witness testimony, so I never worry. So the nuts and bolts of the comparisons between PASS and all the different achievement tests are out there. Well, you have to do those comparisons with an understanding of the reliability of the difference between the scores. In other words, test them for significance, right? You don't just want to look at them and say, this one looks like it's similar or not. So in my essentials book, I provide the differences that are required for significance when you compare PASS to all the achievement test scores that you could get, possibly get. But it's a pain to do by yourself. So I created these Excel spreadsheets that you can get on my website. You go to my website on the clinician's corner, you choose past score analyzers, and you'll get this list. So here are the past score analyzers for the FAR and the FAM, that's Steve Pfeiffer's, the WJ, for the Wyatt 3, the Battery, the KT, and you just click on whatever one you want, and you'll get a spreadsheet like this. And the way that this works, I entered the scores for this boy, 92, 92, 110, and 75. It calculates the differences from the mean, tells you if it's significant or not, and if it's a strength or weakness. And then it tells you here, the scores are discrepant or consistent from each of the four past scores. And it builds a triangle for you. This triangle is really helpful. <clears throat> and you should use this whenever you talk to anybody about your results. It should be in your report. And it should definitely be, and you should bring that to any eligibility committee meeting because people get it. I mean, it just makes sense. It's clear, it's concise, and it really helps you communicate what you found. So the different tabs here are for different versions, like the, the CAS core battery is eight subtests, the, CA, the CAS extended battery is 12. So different level of subtests, different reliabilities. So the calculations are going to be um, influenced by those different reliabilities. So that's how it works. And the first page gives you instructions, and the last page in, in this document 
shows you the correspondence between all the different subtests and PASS, like a crosswalk. So successive processing is required for the phonemic awareness subtest on the cat on the far for example. Does that make sense? Does this look like it would be something you'd want to use? Yeah. It really, it it you know, it's these these are my own tests. I don't want to have to look up all these time numbers either, you know. So that's why I did it. So here we are now. What are you going to do about it? Now let's just stop for a second. Usually when you get to intervention, you're not going to have the same kind of things that I'm going to show you next. So here's an intervention protocol. This is also something I developed with my colleague Kathleen Kreiser. So what's the first step? The first step is help the student understand their past strengths and weaknesses in a very intentional and a very clear and transparent way. How often do we tell the students that we attest what we found? Not very often. But you can now, because PASS is not so complicated. I mean, it's just not. It's pretty straightforward. So what that does is that changes the student's mindset about themselves. Because now they, they're talking to somebody who says, you know what? I see you. I see who you are. I know where it's hard for you. Know where you're really good. And we're going to use what you're really good at to take care of that, those things that are difficult. Once you change the mindset of that student, and I've done this, I've told students, and they say things to me like, oh, I thought I was just stupid, and that's why I couldn't do this stuff, right? When they realize, no, they're not stupid, but they have trouble with one area. Really, maybe it's really bad. Like successive processing, 75, that's bad, right? But you say, you know what? You can do something about that. Because we're going to, you're going to use a strategy. You're going to use your brain. You're going to think smart and use a strategy. And now you're encouraging them to be independent. You're encouraging them to self advocate. You change a person's life. So, how does that work? So we talk to the child about his strengths and weaknesses. We teach things like growth mindset. You know, if you think you can't do it, chances are you're not going to because you're really not going to try, right? I mean, the little engine that could, it's a good message. Nothing wrong with that. Um, you, you build on strengths. So we use planning and simultaneous and attention. We use planning and simultaneous strength to support the learning challenges and we develop this is this is um, this is a little mistake right here. I didn't edit this properly. Um, and attention, and we're going to help the child deal with the issues with successive processing. And what we're, the way that we're going to do that is we're going to first tell the student think smart and use a plan. And you know you can show them a picture of a of a uh, of a brain and talk about the different parts of the brain. Kids get that. You know, look at this, figure out how to solve problems, see how things go together or are all related, work with things in sequence, focus and resist distraction. I mean, kids get that. So think smart and use a plan. Each one of these is a solution that you are able to give to a parent, a teacher, and a student, him or herself. These are handouts from my Helping Children Learn book. Oops, didn't mean to go there yet. These handouts are intended for you to, uh, to be shared by you with everybody. So it's not a copyright problem if you copy them and give them away. We have a CD where you can print them out or capture them on a DVD, on a PDF attachment to your report. So for this case, because the child is or in successful processing, we're going to teach that child and the parents and the teacher about the value of chunking and segmenting. And the best way to do that is to give them a one or two page handout on what is segmenting and what is chunking. And how they could use graphic organizers, plans, overcome anxiety, because the kid is obviously anxious 
when they're trying to do anything that goes in order, right? Because the whole child, you got to remember that whenever a person has a problem, they're probably anxious whenever they're doing that thing they have a problem with. 